Good morning, evening, whatever it is. This is part two uh, of Virginia and the Southern Colonies. We saw last time what a miserable failure Jamestown was for a long, long time until John Smith showed up, but then he had to leave again because he was almost killed in a gunpowder explosion. What saved Jamestown and what made civilization in the South possible was a plant. There's a lot of botany and religion in this part of the course. And the plant was tobacco, which you have some slides there. So I am starting with slide number 10 um, in the file entitled Southern and Middle Colonies. Okay, tobacco, um, I have a different take on it than the textbook does. It says easy to grow. Um, I don't think so. Not from the sources I've read. Um, it is not tricky to grow, but it is very, two very important things about tobacco. It is labor intensive, needs a lot of work, and land intensive, wears out the soil very quickly. So this is where Virginia becomes called, and John Smith called it from the beginning, a society founded upon smoke. And he meant, of course, tobacco, which wasn't smoked in the beginning. They snorted it, snuff up their nose. Uh, he had a double meaning and he knew exactly what he was talking about. A society, if you build your society, if you build your civilization on smoke, you have a very shaky foundation. And he knew exactly what the double meaning of that was. So remember that Virginia is a joint stock company. It was profit oriented from the beginning, unlike Massachusetts. Um, the only thing they found in the beginning that was profitable at all was furs, traded for the Indians for furs, and of course those were wiped out pretty quickly. They tried sugarcane, silk, wine, olives, no gold there. They hit on tobacco. And John Rolfe, Pocahontas' husband, is the one who brings a strain of a mild Jamaican from the Caribbean variety of tobacco. He comes in 1611 and marries uh, Pocahontas, I think 1618, something like that, okay? Native Americans had used tobacco in very small quantities. Medicinally, it was used as a drug and ceremoniously and also as an insect repellent. They knew that burning it, the smoke would drive off mosquitoes and other insects. Um, tobacco is an ideal trading plant. It dries, it stores well for long periods, and most of all, it is highly addictive, as we know. So the British and the American tobacco planters become drug pushers to the world, thanks to Jamestown. Uh, we call it today, and it was then a recreational drug. Within a few years, there are 7,000 tobacco dealers just in London, and Glasgow in Scotland was built on tobacco. Uh, I have actually been to Glasgow several times. If you walk around Glasgow today, there are many of the older buildings that have tobacco leaves carved in the doorways because they were trading houses buying and selling tobacco. Just to give you an idea, I don't care about the numbers, but 1618, they sent 20,000 pounds. 20 years later, from 20,000 pounds, catch this, a million pounds. 1670, 15 million pounds of dried tobacco leaves. Uh, 1728 million, and by 1760, 80 million pounds of tobacco per year are being sent from the Chesapeake to Europe and all over the rest of the world. Tobacco was so important that when they made the uh, Capitol building in Washington, D.C., in the new Capitol, the columns, the, the Corinthian columns, did not have the old uh, Greek acanthus leaves in them. They made tobacco leaves in the columns of the Capitol. If you ever go look up and look at them. Uh, the key thing about tobacco, it is land intensive. It uses up the nutri nutrients in the soil very quickly after three or four crops. Your yield goes down quite a bit. They didn't have crop rotation. They didn't have um, manure. They had lots of animals, but the animals in America were just turned out to forage in the woods. They were not restricted in fields, so they were not put on to manure the fields like they were in Britain. Uh, it was much cheaper just to push the Indians out and use their land or clear new land. So the one thing, if you're a tobacco farmer, 
The one thing you need, you constantly need more land, which means you are in constant conflict with Native Americans from the beginning. The other thing that is a factor with tobacco is that it is very labor intensive. You need work pretty much all year round. And I'm spending some time on this because this is the cause of slavery in America. They figured out per worker, a worker could take care of roughly one to two acres of tobacco. Again, an acre for all you farmers out there is about the size of a football field. So one person for let's say two football fields. Uh, one to two acres produced a thousand pound barrel of tobacco. That thousand pounds of tobacco would sell in London or Glasgow, Scotland for about 200 English pounds, 200 English dollars. The average salary of a working man at the time was five to 10 pounds. So a single barrel, a thousand pounds of tobacco would give you essentially 200 pounds of money, pound to English dollar. So your profit in Virginia and Maryland depended strictly on the number of workers you could hold because you have lots of land. Land was never a problem. The issue was how many workers could you get to work the land? And as one planter said, our principal wealth consists in servants, hashtag slaves. Land was decreasing in value because the land was wearing out quickly, but slaves and before them indentured workers were appreciating in value, becoming more valuable. So here's what you need for tobacco. And this is why I would argue with the book that it's not an easy plant to take care of. You plant the seeds in March, in the spring, but the seeds are very delicate. The seedlings are very uh, tender. They have to be planted either indoors or under some kind of shelter, some kind of a roof. If you planted them in the direct sun, which is pretty intense in, in the South and Virginia, uh, they would wither and die. So you had to start the seedlings under some kind of protection. In April, you plowed the fields while the seedlings were growing. In May, you transplanted these young seedlings about, you know, eight inches tall, and you replanted them outdoors in the open field, okay? Uh, you had to take the plants one by one and transplant them. How many plants per acre? Three to 5,000, one by one. This is where you need the labor. A large farm might plant every spring 100,000 tobacco plants. And remember, it's not the landowner who's planting them. It's his workers who are planting them. Um, in July, in July to September, you didn't just leave them in the field like you did with wheat, but you had to weed constantly. It's a slow growing plant. If you didn't uh, cut down the weeds around it, it would smother it and they wouldn't get enough sun and it would die. There is such a thing as tobacco worms, these big ugly worms that would eat all the leaves. Every third, fourth day, you had to go through the rows and pick off the tobacco worms. Otherwise you'd have no leaves and you'd have no tobacco. You had to cut the tops. Uh, there's illustrations in there in that file of a tobacco plant, a blooming tobacco plant. So three, four times, probably every three, four weeks, you had to top off, as they called it, the plant after it had 10 or 12 leaves on it. Otherwise, all the growth would go into the flower and the seeds and not into the leaves. Any gardener knows you cut off the flowering parts. October, November, you cut the leaves cut the plant and you hang them upside down to dry in an open shed. There's a slide of that also in the file. We still do this. If you drive through Kentucky and Tennessee, particularly, you will still see these big buildings. They look just like barns, but if you look closely, the boards on the side are separated so the air can circulate. It's not a barn, it's a tobacco shed to dry the tobacco leaves. Couple of months, they dry. In December and January, the dried leaves are taken down and the leaves are, are cut away. The leafy part is cut away from the stems, including the main stem on the leaf, very labor intensive. Then you pack them in these thousand pound barrels and then you ship them to market. So in other words, nine months of the year, you have some pretty intensive solid labor. Um, 
a good planter would produce a good quality tobacco leaf and that gave him a good reputation and higher set status. They talked about the tobacco lords of London and Glasgow. Okay, now here's the issue. If you need so much labor, who do you get to do it? The history of England particularly, and in most of Northern Europe except for Spain, there were no slaves or extremely rare. What there had been for years and years was a very long tradition of apprenticeship, which we still do in some of the building trades today, um, basically contract labor. The first thing that Southerners tried in Virginia and Maryland was to use the workers that they had around, which were Native Americans. Once they were defeated in wars, or if they could get them any other way, they tried Native Americans, which was a total failure. Number one, Native American societies, except for the Hopi and Pueblo, all of the agriculture is done by women. So you are asking warriors to go out and plow the fields. Uh, they're not gonna do it. More importantly, how do you keep them? Unless they are chained 24 hours a day, they're gonna take off. They live there, they blend. That's why when Indians were captured, they were sold down to the Caribbean because they knew there was no way they could hold them. They would run off the first chance they got. So that's a total failure. So wealthy landowners or uh, younger sons of wealthy men in England who come, they have large pieces of land and they continue the practice that existed in England, which was basically contract labor. It was called indenture because you had a piece of paper with two copies of the contract, it was folded or indented. You got one half and your employer got the other half. And that's where the term indenture comes from. This was a very successful system for, you know, since the Middle Ages in most of Northern Europe. People were happy to sign up for this and come to, with all the dangers, to come to the New World, to come to the Chesapeake, they signed up for three to seven years. Five years was the average term. Uh, you provided your labor. Your employer provided food, clothing, shelter, passage over, which was the equivalent of a year's worth, a year's salary at the time. You were entitled to, in most contracts, I love this part, 10 gallons of rum a year. And at the end of your service, you were supposed to get 50 acres of land because there's nothing but land in America. So you're a poor boy in England, a 17 year old kid. This sounds pretty good. Where are you ever going to become a landowner? It was almost impossible by this time in England. So not surprisingly, 80% of the people who came to the Chesapeake area before 1700 are indentures. Most of them are male. Some were female, brought as household servants. Ratio again was six to one, six males for every female. Almost all 15 to 25 years old, healthy young workers. Some were political prisoners. Some came for religious reasons to get out of England, most because it was a, an economic opportunity, better than what they had. This worked beautifully in Europe, a system uh, for years and years and years. In America, it turns very quickly into a form of slavery. And I'm quoting an indentured servant who wrote home, a servant by going to Virginia becomes for a number of years, a thing, a commodity with a price, a machine to make tobacco for someone else. They became machines, they became like slaves, although legally not slaves. Uh, they quickly lost any legal rights they would have had um, in England. They were bought and sold, they were traded, uh, they were on occasion murdered. Indentures talked about the buying and selling of men and boys. There were many, many capital crimes, special rules, made for indentured servants. You could not marry without your owner's permission because of course you weren't gonna be as productive. You could not gamble, you could not swear, you could not miss church three times. That was a serious offense. Uh, of course, you could not be publicly drunk. The punishment for any of these crimes was 
years added on to your indenture contract. They are so desperate for labor, basically the system is rigged against the workers. They are going to keep you there any way they can. A um, good example of this, and this was done regularly, oh, there you go, Samuel. I can see your indenture is going to be over at Christmas, and uh, this is Thanksgiving time. Let's go down, and I'll buy you some drinks at the local pub, and we'll celebrate. Public drunkenness, another year added on to your indenture. So in a way, it is a trap to go to Virginia. Um, one of the things that happened to women that were brought as servants uh, remember, they could not get married until their term was over, but they certainly could get pregnant by their owners, and a good percentage did. Guess what the punishment for getting pregnant was if you were an indentured woman? Years added on to your service. They finally figured out after 30, 40 years that the way you could keep a permanent servant is just keep getting her pregnant. And sometimes this happened. Then they figured out, let's take the woman and put her in a different household. Maybe she has a better chance at it. The indentures were overworked. They were often underfed. They were treated, as they said, barbarously, like barbarians. Uh, so bad was the condition that in Spain, two Moors, two North African Muslims who had committed some minor crime, they were given a choice. You can go to America as an indentured servant, or we'll hang you. And the two Moors chose hanging death rather than go to uh, the Americas. They chose, and I'm quoting from the court documents, to rather die on the gallows quickly than to die slowly many deaths, as is the case in Virginia. So it was better to die than to go to Virginia or Maryland as an indentured servant. The death rate was horrendous. Not only are they overworked, uh, underfed, uh, maltreated, occasionally killed by their owners, that was not the big killer to go to Virginia was to commit suicide. The reason basically was disease. In the South, the death rate is twice that of Massachusetts. The lifespan in the Southern colonies, 20 years less than Massachusetts. The big killer, malaria, because you have a hot climate and very slow, stagnant rivers. Within five to seven years before their indentures ran out, 65% are dead. We have the statistics because we have the ship logs and the legal documents. 169, I never ask you the numbers here, 1619 to 1621, 3,500 indentures are shipped to Virginia. Within five years, 3,000 of the 3,500 are dead, largely of malaria. In one county, 3,700 indentures later on in Virginia. Of the 3,700, 1,200 survivors. Um, any single day on any tobacco plantation, 40% of the workers were ill and not able to function largely from malaria. The other factor, which they didn't know when they signed up, and there's not much they can do about it because they have no money for legal fees and they have no power, is that they rarely got their land. Again, we have the legal documents, maybe 5% of the indentures actually got those 50 acres that most of them were promised. And of course, the 50 acres you're gonna get is the crappy, nasty land that's way out there where the Indians can attack you. They're not gonna give you their good, cleared land. You got whatever the owner decided. So within a few years, 10% owned 75% of the land in Virginia. 70% of the farmers are either tenants or indentures. Only 25% of all the landowner of, of people in Virginia actually own their own land, and half of those are large landowners employing a number of others. There's a very interesting chart. Slide 17, I think, is very interesting, although it's a little hard to distinguish the uh, variations there. You see everything changes by 1700. So in the northern colonies, there are always a very few slaves, but not so many. In the middle colonies, there are more, particularly New York City, because of the Dutch influence, Dutch were heavy in the slave trade, there's a, a decent number of slaves. But in the south, there are very few until about 1680. 
And then it just escalates and a large number of slaves are imported. The question is why? The answer is indentures stopped coming and they were desperate for labor. Owners would have loved to have indentures. They were English speaking, uh, they knew the culture, they were easy to deal with, but they stopped coming. Not all these people are illiterate. When the word got back, nobody wanted to come to Virginia or Maryland. So out of desperation, Southern landowners began to purchase slaves. Remember, slaves were not cheap, you had to buy them. Then of course, you have their labor for life, but indentures are temporary, but they're also free. So if you're starting a plantation indenture made logical sense, it didn't cost you anything to contract your workers as opposed to slave labor, which is expensive to start. So slavery, um, early slavery, slide number 16, very different, ironically enough, in the new and the old world. Old world slavery in Asia, Africa, and parts of Southern Europe uh, was not hereditary. It was based on your status. And the example that's really easy to understand um, is um, Russell Crowe and Gladiator. Why is he fighting? He's fighting for his freedom. He is certainly not black. If you look at the slaves in Gladiator, they're all mixed races, all mixed countries. How did you become a slave historically? You lost the war. The, the losers in the war were either executed on the spot or sold into slavery. Slaves historically, even in Africa, but certainly in Muslim countries, had some rights. They could marry. They could even own their own property, sometimes including other slaves. Uh, they could buy land and sell land. They had legal rights in court. They could uh, legally, I said, marry. Um, their kids could leave slavery. Their kids weren't necessarily slaves. The word, com the word slave comes from Slavic countries, from Russia, because these were the people that were captured and sent to work in the sugar plantations in the Mediterranean. Portugal broke the Muslim monopoly on slaves. Uh, they began exporting and dealing in slaves. Spain soon followed, and then the Dutch took over by 1600 and became very prominent in the slave trade. The British joined after that. Slavery changes in the New World. Slavery becomes hereditary slavery by the status of the mother. If your mother is a slave, you are born into slavery and you stay a slave. It is very difficult to leave slavery. It also becomes racial slavery very quickly in the New World. If you are black, you are a slave. The heredity part is very interesting because, of course, in Europe, everything is patriarchal. Your ancestry is traced through the father. Very quickly, they figured out, can't do that with slaves for obvious reasons. We will trace ancestry through the mother. So if your father was white and your mother was black, you were born and stayed a slave. Um, or I'm going to talk a lot about slavery later. But the advantages of slaves, of course, you own them for life. They did not blend with Indian populations. They really can't run off too often. Uh, a few did, particularly in Georgia. Sometimes they did and later on created their own uh, wilderness communities and intermarried with Indians. Um, in South Carolina and Georgia, there were large rice plantations, African Certain African regions grew rice in Africa, so they were already familiar with the whole culture of rice growing as well. And slave importers were very careful to say, I want some slaves from this part of Africa because I'm growing rice and I want the people who know how to grow rice. There is quite a bit of evidence that slaves had a higher survival rate. They were probably more heat resistant than Northern Europeans who grew up in a cold climate. The other reason actually is a very odd, interesting one. They had some re resistance to malaria. If you know about sickle cell disease, it is uh, found uh, fairly rarely, but um, found in, in American populations among African Americans. It is also found in Africans. Sickle cell is an adaptation to malaria. Uh, 
Mediterranean people like me, Greeks, Spaniards, Italians, have a very mild form of sickle cell, actually a very low iron count called thalassemia. Thal thalassa is the Greek word for C. Mediterranean people often have mild anemia. Sickle cell, of course, is malformed red blood cells. Anemia is a lower count of red blood cells. I can't ever donate blood because I don't have enough red blood cells. Okay, so these are adaptations to malaria because you are not a good host. So you will probably get malaria, but you probably won't die from it. Whereas the guy next to you who has a lot of healthy red blood cells will die quickly from malaria. So there is some genetic evidence that African-Americans had some mild resistance to malaria. Whatever the reasons, and it certainly wasn't better treatment, whatever the reasons, their survival rate was higher than those Englishmen who came as indentures. Very quickly, they figure out we need to import a lot of slaves. Again, the numbers are interesting, but I'm not going to get into that or ever ask you. 1619, the first Africans arrive in Virginia, and they didn't even know what to do.